end of 5 and chapter 6, where it starts to shift towards the Christian life. We're still wrapping up this section on eternal security and asking the question, if you can't lose eternal salvation, then what can you lose? And we've already seen that you can lose your reward in heaven. You can lose fellowship with God. And that would be very unfortunate. But you can also lose the joy of your salvation. In fact, we're going to see now seven more things in this next lesson that we can lose as believers in Jesus Christ, though we don't lose our salvation. And here in Psalm 51, the context is David, the king of Israel, is writing this after he's committed sin with Bathsheba. Remember, he's committed adultery with her. And not only that, but he had her husband, uh, Uriah, sent out to the front lines of the battle so that he would certainly be killed. And in, in effect, as God saw it, it was murder, and it was. So based on David's sin, and this had gone on for some time, David had not confessed his sin to the Lord now for several months. Talk about being self-deceived. He looked the part of you know, this godly king this time until Nathan the prophet came in and said, uh, he rebuked him, and uh, David repented in the sense that he changed his mind. He admitted where he was at before the Lord. He acknowledged his sin. So he writes Psalm 51 as a psalm of confession. And in Psalm 51, let's read together verses 1 through 4. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. I'm sure it was weighing on his mind. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Here he's acknowledging his sin to the Lord. Uh, though he had sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, he acknowledged here that it was not only a sin this way, perhaps he had already um, acknowledged this with Bathsheba, Uriah is already dead, so now the issue was between him and the Lord. He had, to, he had to get things straightened out, and so he confessed his sin to God. But notice what he had lost during this time of carnality that he is turning to the Lord for. Um, Let's just go to verse seven or verse 11, because I think this is relevant as well. He says, do not cast me away from your presence, not from salvation, but from uh, him being king in Israel. And by the way, it was possible to lose kingship status. Remember Saul? He lost his kingship. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, oftentimes people refer to this passage as a proof text for losing salvation, but of course this is prior to the dispensation of grace and the sealing, permanent ministry, permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every believer's life. So it was possible that the Holy Spirit could have left David. And he feared that possibility, not loss of salvation, but the filling of the Spirit as a servant of the Lord, as many were in the Old Testament. And then he says, verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Notice what David had lost that needed to be restored. He had lost not his salvation, but the joy of his salvation. And he wants that joy back. And remember what we saw in 1 John chapter 1, the very purpose of fellowship with God is so that we might have joy and that our joy might be full. And joy, of course, is a fruit of what? The Spirit of God, right? The Holy Spirit. Before I go there, I'm going to make one more point here. What does it say in Galatians 5.22? That the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. The second thing mentioned, right? So how do we have joy in our life? It's by walking in fellowship with the Lord, i.e. walking by means of the Spirit of God, where he produces love and joy. We can have that. But when we sin, we grieve the Spirit of God. 
We're no longer filled at that point. We lose the joy of our salvation. In fact, I think people who walk out of fellowship for a longer period of time are miserable, usually, for extended periods of time, and they've definitely lost the joy of their salvation. It happens quite a bit. You meet believers who've been carnal for years, and they're absolutely miserable creatures. So it is possible to lose the joy of our salvation, but not our salvation. It's also possible to lose fruitfulness for the Lord. And this ties right into what we've been seeing about fellowship and joy. For if joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that can only be produced by the Spirit of God, not ourselves, then it stands to reason that we must abide in fellowship with the Lord to be fruitful. John 15 is the classic passage on this, where Jesus Christ says he's the true vine, and as believers we are branches connected to him as the vine, and only as we abide in him Verse 4 says, it's white here, only as we abide in him and he, will he abide in us. Not in the sense of permanent indwelling, but in the sense of like the filling of the Spirit, the enablement of Jesus Christ abiding in fellowship with us. As we abide in him, he abides in us. As a branch, we cannot bear fruit by ourselves. We must abide in the vine. Christ says, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing, he says here. And so it is possible for a believer who's not walking or abiding in Jesus Christ, who's remaining in dependence upon the source of life in our Christian life, namely the the vine, it's possible to be detached as a branch and not have his life flowing through us because we're not remaining in dependence upon him as the source of life in our Christian life. And then we dry up as a branch and we become unfruitful. And it's very important, again, to keep in mind that we are never told to produce fruit spiritually, but only to bear it. Because God doesn't ask us to do something that's supernaturally impossible that only he can do. But he does say, abide in me and let me produce my fruit in and through you. And that's why it's very important in the Christian life to to remember that it's a supernatural way of life that demands his supernatural ability in and through us. Otherwise, we, we in essence think we're supermen, but we have this big S on our chest and we're going to take over for the Holy Spirit. And that's just utter blasphemy. We can't produce spiritual fruit, but we can bear it as we abide in him. So learning to abide in him is critical. John 15, 8, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The Lord wants us to bear much fruit. That's his will. In John 15, 11, he goes on to say, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, your joy may be full. Joy and fruitfulness are intertwined as well as fellowship with the Lord. But as I said, it is possible to be a barren branch. You know, especially this time of year where it's early to mid-April, snow is melting away. You've got a few little tiny pockets in the, in the shade areas still. But nothing's green yet. It's kind of that just dingy, dead period between winter and the first buds of spring. Well, that's kind of like the believer who's not abiding in Jesus Christ. It's a branch, but it's a barren branch. But that branch can be fruitful as we abide in him. So this is the difference. And it is possible to lose this. That's why in 2 Peter 1.8, he says, For if these things are yours and abound, they may or they may not, if, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is it possible to be genuinely saved and be barren and unfruitful? Isn't that clearly the implication of 2 Peter 1.8? Absolutely, contrary to what Lordship Salvation teaches. This is a great verse to use for example, when it comes to that. 
false teaching. So it is certainly possible, but it doesn't have to be. And God forbid that it, that is true in our lives. Here's another thing that we can lose, a fifth thing. We can lose the direction in our Christian life. The direction in our Christian life. And purpose. The passage is up here, so you don't have to turn to it. Mark 8, verse 34 through 38 by the way, you could put down as a parallel passage, a one that I think is perhaps even clearer than this one. You could put a parallel to this as Matthew 16, 24 through 27. In fact, you know what? You've got Matthew 8 already in your notes, is that right? You should. I mean, Mark 8, yeah. Write that down if you don't have it. And then let's actually turn in our Bibles to Matthew 16, because I think this one's an even better reference. It sheds light more on what Mark 8 is saying. You'll probably be tested on Mark 8, but no Matthew 16 as well. They say the same thing, but Matthew sheds some more light on it, and he actually uses the term reward here. It tells us what the, the true point of this passage is. Now, in Matthew 16, the context is that Jesus and the disciples have gone to Caesarea Philippi. They're on a retreat, so to speak, up in the northern part of Israel to get away from all the crowds and the masses and everything. And so Jesus has his disciples gathered among himself, and he asks them the pivotal question, who do men say that I am? Some say, well, you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead, or you're Jeremiah or Elijah, one of the prophets. And then he says, but who do you guys say that I am? See, now is a pivotal time. You've been following me for a while. You guys got to make up your minds. Who do you think I am? I want to hear you say it. And Peter speaks up as the spokesman for the group, usually. Uh, and here he does the same. And he says... You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Peter thinks he's doing pretty well, remember? And Jesus says, from that point on, it's that Jesus says he told them that he's going to Jerusalem where he's going to be killed and be resurrected, and what does Peter do? He says, boy, I had a great point about 10 minutes ago. I think I'm going to speak up again. And he says, Lord, far be it from you to go to Jerusalem and be killed. I've got a better plan. And Jesus says what to him? Get behind me, Satan. Satan means adversary, one who opposes. And at that point, Peter was actually opposing the plan of God, which was for Jesus Christ to go to Jerusalem and and in that context, we read, right on the heels of the rebuke, this is part of what Jesus is saying here, verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, he said to all of them right after he rebuked Peter, so as Peter's sitting there with his head down, picture Jesus saying now this to all the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What he's saying is, look guys, I'm going to Jerusalem to be crucified. You want to follow me? I don't mean just go to Jerusalem. I mean, are you willing to take up your cross and die? Because that's what following me is going to entail. Self-sacrifice now. Persecution. Verse 25, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now there are those who take verse 25... 26, where it talks about the soul. If any man gains the whole world and loses his own soul, what shall he give in exchange for his soul? They take those verses as salvation verses, and you, you hear them used at crusades sometimes, or evangelistic crusades. You, know, you want to save your soul? Yeah, let's, we're soul winners. That's kind of the idea. So what you need to do is, uh, you're willing to give up your life. But what's the context? Who's he talking to, first of all? His disciples. He's not talking to a crowd of unsaved people. And he's talking about the cost of what it will entail to follow him. 
Is there a cost to being saved from hell? Well, yeah, but Christ bore all that. There's no cost to us. It's free. But there will be a cost to follow him, he says, the cost of discipleship. And you can waste your life by living for yourself and lose your life in that sense, and that's what soul here is, is used in regards to, is the life. But notice verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will do what? Reward each according to his works. And so this is a reward passage. He's promising these disciples that if they would follow him and even be willing to suffer and lose their lives for his sake, they will be rewarded generously in the kingdom of Very clearly, it's a reward passage. Okay, any question about that passage? Now, it is possible that if we're not abiding in him and following Jesus Christ, that when Christ comes back, we may be ashamed before him at his coming. Later, Peter was ashamed of Jesus Christ, remember? In the courtyard, and the um, servant girl of the high priest who was sitting there, she said, I recognize you. You're from Galilee, aren't you? I can tell by your, your accent. You're one of his. You're one of the followers of Jesus. Peter swore up and down three times. I don't know the man. He denied Christ three times. And he hung his head in shame. The rooster crowed. Christ looked right at him. It wasn't one of those, see, I told you so, Peter. It was one of those looks of, Peter, I love you. And you just disappointed me. And Peter melted when he saw the Lord Jesus look at him as he was let off to be condemned. But it is possible not to follow Christ and to be ashamed before him at his coming. And time spent in carnality is costly. We will lose the greater reward we could have had. We'll lose the opportunity to glorify the Lord in a greater way that we could have. We lose fellowship in the meantime. We lose joy in the meantime. We lose direction and purpose in our life. We waste our life upon self. Chasing pleasures of this world, even if it's just approbation lust, the approval and the esteem of others. For what? To lose the approval of the Lord. So it's possible to lose direction in our life. Here's a sixth thing that we can lose. And these are all connected, by the way. There's just kind of shades of difference among them. We can lose testimony to others. Testimony to others. Think of Lot in the Old Testament. Remember him? He was saved. He was righteous. Justified Lot. We know that from 2 Peter chapter 2. By the way, we'd never know that otherwise. <laughs> I'm sure if you just had your Old Testament and you were going by that, you'd scratch your head as 2 Peter is saying, he was justified? Really? <laughs> well, that's what the Word of God says in the New Testament, which is the inspired commentary on the Old Testament. But as you look at his, Lot's life in the Old Testament, there was nothing by way of evidence that would point to him being saved, the one who walked by faith. He clearly walked by sight. He did what he wanted. He uh, went down to Sodom. He became a, a judge there, respected in the community there, uh, this community of absolutely wicked people who despised the Lord. And so the time comes for him to be dragged out of Sodom by the angels, and he tells his sons-in-law that, look, we got to leave town. This place is going to be destroyed. And they laugh at him. They laugh in his face, and they think he's joking. Wow. <laughs> he was a saved man, but he had lost his testimony to others. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, 
and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now it's true that we don't do what we do to be seen by men. That shouldn't be our motive. But the fact is men are watching our lives. Right? The unsaved will watch you more carefully when you open your mouth and identify with Jesus Christ and give testimony to him and share the gospel with others. If they are opposed to the gospel, they will look at your life with extra scrutiny to look for a reason to justify rejecting the gospel. Don't give them a handle to grab. Let them look in vain. So our lives do matter. They should be a credi credible backup for our verbal testimony. Our life should match our lives. Another passage here is Philippians 2, 13 through 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We are in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And the next verse goes on to say, holding forth the word of life. You know, if you do all things without grumbling and complaining, that sets you apart immediately from the world. Do you have thankfulness and joy in your heart towards the Lord? What a difference you become in contrast to the world. So that's the sixth uh, thing that we can lose, our testimony. We can also lose our ministry to others, our ministry to others. Matthew 20, verse 28 says, regarding Jesus Christ, that just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. He is the model or example in terms of the mindset that we should all have, that his purpose was coming down here to earth to serve, and then later to be glorified and rewarded. But first comes the cross, then the crown. And our mindset should be, we are here, first of all, to serve others, not to be served, per se. If that happens, great, but our purpose and our mindset should be we're here to serve, not to self be self-serving, but to serve others. And that involves sacrifice, that involves humility, that involves a definite mindset. <clears throat> Hebrews 6.10 says, that God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you've shown toward his name. That's why I think, too, he won't forget those good works you did in the past, even if you were out of fellowship for some time. He's not unrighteous or unjust to say, forget all those. But in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, there's definitely a place for ministry to others. Here's an eighth thing that we can lose, and that is our assurance of salvation. Our assurance of salvation. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter 1. We already saw in verse 8 where it says, if these things are yours and abound, that you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But verse 9 goes on to say, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Now, would you ever say to an unbeliever that, Oh, you've just forgotten you were cleansed from your old or past sins. Well, this is true only of one who's had their sins once forgiven, right? Only of a believer. So it is possible for a believer to lack these things and be short-sighted and even to forget that he was cleansed from his old sins, initially saved. It is possible for one who is genuinely saved to lose the assurance of salvation. It's important to recognize the distinction again between security and assurance. Security is based on what God says, he says I can never lose salvation. Assurance is based on what I know, what I think personally. 
that I cannot lose my salvation. Security is a fact. Assurance is faith in that fact. One is objective, the other is subjective. There are several reasons why people can lose the assurance of salvation. Oftentimes people go by their feelings. They say, well, I just don't feel like I'm saved. Well, since when do we live our life based on feelings instead of facts in the Word of God? If we live by our feelings, we'll be up and down all over the place. Someone said years ago, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My only warrant is the Word of God. It's the only thing worth believing. How's that, John? Andrew. Maybe you could put that to a rap or something. I'm sure you could say it a lot better than I just said it. You ever heard Andrew rap, by the way? He gave his whole testimony at his baptism. Uh, what was it, a rap per se? No, it wasn't a rap. It was, it was like a poem, that, a rhyme. You know? it, had a, it had a rhythm to it, that's for sure. It sure felt good to those of us who heard it, though. <laughs> but we don't, we're, we don't base our assurance based on our feelings, or do we? <clears throat> no, we shouldn't. It's like... Uh, how many of you here are U.S. citizens? Everyone, right? If you feel like one? Yeah. <laughs> Proud to be American? Maybe some days you aren't. <laughs> you know? The fact is your birth certificate tells you whether you're truly a citizen or not. And that's all that matters. And you need to go back and maybe look at your birth certificate sometimes if you doubt whether you are or not. Spiritually, that's what we're to do. But sometimes, you know, people go by their feelings or um, sometimes people have different personality types. It seems like about once a year I get a phone call or an email or I end up talking with someone who says, <clears throat> I, I can see that salvation is just by faith alone, but how do I know I really believe? And that's a fair question, but people who often get hung up on that question time and time again I've seen are usually people who are very analytical. I mean, they, they, they just want to mull over things like crazy. Um, it's a certain personality type. It's extremely analytical. And uh, oftentimes what happens in that case is they're, what they're really doing is they're looking at their faith, which itself can be subjective, rather than the object of faith. And I, I usually will say to people like that, if this was three years ago, for example, I'll, I'll have said, um, well, do you believe that the President of the United States is Barack Obama? Yeah. Are you sure? Well, yeah, of course. How do you know? You say you believe it. How do you know you really believe it? Well, because it's obvious. Facts are all there. I said, how do you feel about it? <laughs> Doesn't matter how I feel about it, it's still true. Why can't you do the same with Jesus Christ and salvation? Why is it somehow different with him? But I'll tell you what the difference is. Oftentimes people will look at the nature of their faith and say, well, do I really believe? Do I have enough faith? Do I have the right kind of faith? Do I believe enough? Instead of the object of their faith. Because when people can get their eyes on Jesus Christ and off of themselves, your assurance comes back. Now, I said three years ago with Barack Obama because that's more obvious that he you know, was our president, had been for five years to that point, and there was no debate about it. You ask that same question today, well, how do you, how do you feel about Donald Trump being our president now? And you might have people honestly say, well, I still don't believe he is because they're sour over the results of the election. So that's why I used Barack Obama from three years ago. Because <laughs> nobody disputes that he really was our president. But you get the point. Some people psychoanalyze even faith itself. And that's a sure recipe for loss of assurance, but not loss of salvation. Another very common way, probably the most common way, that people lose assurance of salvation is through false teaching that you can lose salvation. They're just flat out told that uh, you can lose it. 
you know, interpret 1 John as the test of salvation book. Yet 1 John 5.13 is very clear. These things I have written to you who believe. And by the way, these things in that context refers to these things in the immediate context of chapter 5. Because he's just talked about the cross, the work of Christ. He's talked about the promise of salvation and eternal life. And then he comes along with verse 13. He's not talking about the whole book. So these things in the immediate context that I've written to you, who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Eternal life can be known. And by the way, this has tremendous effects on our Christian life. Can you imagine if you had a child in your home who didn't know if he was part of the family from day to day? Even though you kept telling him that, he kept doubting it. How would that affect him practically in his life? He'd live without security, without stability. He wouldn't adjust to his environment very well. Furthermore, wouldn't it affect your relationship with your, your son, your child? If he said to you, I don't know if I can really call you dad. Wouldn't that be sad? And yet there are people who are saved, who lose their assurance, who are in that very condition spiritually. Here's a ninth thing that you can lose. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You can lose your faith. Actually, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll stop here first. I uh, published a book last October with the title, Must Faith Endure for Salvation to be Sure? And it's all about this very point, that as believers, we sometimes are not believing. and We can lose our faith. It is not guaranteed to persevere. But that doesn't mean we lose our salvation, because that is kept secure by God. But there are people who deny this very point that Scripture very clearly teaches that Faith itself can be lost. Here's a clear example in, second, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies made concerning you, <coughs> and that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which, in reference to both faith and a good conscience, some have rejected, concerning the faith, have sh suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. By the way, do you turn somebody over to Satan so that they would learn something in a pedagogical sense if they're not a child of God? This is referring to divine discipline for one who's saved. Okay? But it's very clear in verse 9 that their faith suffered shipwreck. By the way, do unsaved people have faith that can suffer shipwreck? No. So this is a case of believers who had gone astray spiritually and their faith suffered shipwreck. Now if you saw a ship crashed on a shore on some island, is that ship seaworthy at that point? Would you say to yourself, now there's a ship that never really existed. No. <laughs> but there are Calvinists who say, now there's a Christian who professes to be saved, who had faith once but lost it. He must have never really been saved. It's like saying that shipwreck right there, that, that never really was a ship. The fact is, it just doesn't float anymore. It doesn't sail. But it really was a ship. And it was real at the time. It's just crashed. And that can happen for believers. That's why I turn with me next to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And here is a more encouraging passage, I think, on the subject of loss of faith. <coughs> <coughs> Where we see God's faithfulness. <coughs> In 2 Timothy 2, look at verse 11. It says, this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, 
we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. This is a passage written to believers. It uses the pronoun we in reference to Paul and Timothy. So Paul's clearly including himself as well as Timothy who had genuine faith. The if clauses that are used here are all first class condition in the Greek, which means if and it's assumed to be true. If we've died with him. In Timothy, I'm assuming we've both died together with Christ. And we have. The moment we were born again, we were placed in union with Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and so forth. We have died positionally. In fact, that's what Romans 6 is going to be all about, which you guys will get to in two weeks. But notice the pillars of eternal security in this passage. If we died with him, and all believers have, right? What's the promise? We shall also live with him. And then verse 13, if we are faithless, and isn't it assumed that at times believers are? Yeah. In fact, you read the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, you will see several examples where Paul warns for real-life Christianity in local churches, that, that it is possible that believers can lose faith. But if we deny him, or if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. He cannot deny himself. He will remain faithful. Faithful to fulfill his promise of salvation. Why? Because even though we may deny him, he can't deny himself. He will uphold his end of the bargain. Well, I read one commentator, John MacArthur, who said, verse 13 is a promise of condemnation. God is promising that if we are faithless, he will be faithful to send us to hell. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. That is horrendous. That's how he interprets it. But it is a positive promise. In fact, everywhere um, in the pastoral epistles where it says that God is faithful. In fact, it could be everywhere in the New Testament, if I remember right, but at least in the pastoral epistles. Everywhere where it says God is faithful, it always has a positive connotation, not a negative connotation of judgment. So you talk about reading your theology into a verse. But anyway, here's the two pillars, and in between, we have verse 12. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. It is possible to deny him, and if so, he will deny us. Not of salvation, but he will deny us of reward, I believe. That's what he's teaching here. And if we endure, we'll have a greater reward and a greater position of reigning with him in service. But in the meantime, our lives are protected by these two pillars, so to speak. And so, it is possible that we can lose several of these things in addition. We can't lose salvation. We can lose a reward, fellowship, joy, fruitfulness, direction in life, testimony to others, ministry to others, and even the assurance of our salvation if we're not walking by faith. Very clear. So, I think when you put all this together, you look at it in a composite fashion, isn't it evident that God is very concerned about our Christian lives. He does not want us to have this frivolous, carefree attitude that says, oh, great, I'm going to heaven, now I can live however I want. He says, oh no, I've got a great plan in store for you. And so that leads us to the end of Romans 5, which we'll look at in our next lesson. So any questions before we break? All right, why don't we take a little longer break of 10 minutes this time, and then we'll, uh, yeah, a whole 10 minutes. <laughs> you had five.